Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Patrick Gilbride from Emergency Medicine Cases, and this is part two of a rapid review of podcast episode 91 on occult knee injuries. Now in part one, we reviewed the differential diagnosis of occult knee injuries, and we covered off on some of the key historical clues like age and mechanism of injury, which can help us narrow down our differentials. In part two, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of these can't-miss diagnoses for knee injuries. We're going to cover occult knee dislocations, We'll cover off on lateral tibial plateau fractures, extensor mechanism injuries, and then round things out with ACL tears. So first up, all of these diagnoses can present with an essentially normal knee x-ray. So when we see a patient with a knee injury, we probably want to use, you know, a forced cognitive strategy to make sure that we at least consider all of the diagnoses that we're talking about here. Okay, first up, let's talk about occult knee dislocations. Practically speaking, the diagnosis of knee dislocation is actually going to be pretty straightforward when the patient presents with an obvious deformity like we got up on the screen here. But 20 to 50% of all knee dislocations are going to spontaneously reduce before that patient even walks into our ED. And in reality, we could just end up looking at a run-of-the-mill swollen knee sitting in front of us. Because of this, it's important that we include some key questions in our assessments of all comers with a knee injury because we really don't want to miss a neurovascular injury which could lead to, you know, ischemic complications or even ultimately a limb amputation. So, you know, what is it when we drill down that we're really looking for on history and physical exam to kind of help us out here? Well, some key historical and physical exam clues to consider would be, first off, is there any evidence of three out of four knee ligament laxity? So ACL, PCL, MCL, or LCL. Second, is there any history of a buckling knee and evidence of a foot drop that would be consistent with a neurologic injury that was possibly suffered during a dislocation? Others would be, you know, knee hyperextension when you lift the leg by the heel, or any history of a high energy mechanism like an MVC. Another subset, though, that isn't actually necessarily intuitive is that low-energy trauma can cause knee dislocations, especially in patients with a BMI greater than 40. In fact, in one study, obese patients with low-energy trauma were much more likely to have associated neurovascular injury than those individuals who had suffered a high-energy trauma. So just because somebody maybe, you know, stepped off a curve, don't reflexively rule out occult knee dislocation in your head right off the hop. It's also important to realize that the presence of normal distal pulses and a normal ABI, so greater than 0.9, does not completely rule out occult popliteal artery injury. If you're suspecting an occult knee dislocation, you want to refer those guys immediately to orthopedics because they're going to need revascularization within 6 to 8 hours of that popliteal artery injury in order to avoid any ischemic complications. Another interesting point from the emerging literature is that actually not all patients are going to require a CT angio for an occult knee dislocation. You know, some of these patients with normal serial exams can just be anticoagulated and admitted for observation. So it really is actually reasonable to discuss any equivocal cases with your local orthopedic surgeon before you get the radiologist on the phone and you pull the trigger on that CT angio. All right, that was knee dislocations. Next up, let's cover a few key points for lateral tibial plateau fractures. When you're assessing for a suspected MCL injury after a valgus force injury, like in our football player here being hit in the knee by an opposing linebacker, or when an elderly individual walks across the street and say, you know, gets hit by a bumper of a car on the lateral aspect of the knee, well, when you're applying that valgus strain to the knee, if the patient starts to complain about lateral and medial knee pain, look for lateral tibial plateau fractures by examining that lateral joint line. Now, occult tibial plateau fractures aren't that uncommon, especially in the elderly patients, so make sure you just take two seconds and assess for lateral tenderness in these patients. Unfortunately, picking up a lateral tibial plateau fracture on an x-ray can be pretty tough, actually. But a couple things you can do to increase your yield when you're interrogating your x-ray is, first off, compare the lateral and medial subchondral lines. The lateral subchondral line should sit higher than the medial. If the lateral is lower, think fracture. Secondly, to increase the sensitivity and specificity of your x-ray series, make sure you get an oblique view. But if you've got significant lateral tenderness, and despite, you know, getting those oblique views and interrogating those lateral and medial subchondral lines, you still think your x-ray is normal, but you've got that patient there and he's got quite a bit of tenderness laterally, well, in that individual, you should probably consider proceeding and getting a CT scan to really rule out that tibial plateau fracture on the lateral aspect. Or if that's not available to you in your ED, you want to put these individuals in protective weight bearing and have them have early orthopedic follow-up. On the other side, if you do see a fracture and is more than 2 millimeters displaced or is split, then you're going to want to refer these individuals directly to ortho from the ED because they can't wait to be seen in follow-up. Those individuals may need surgery more urgently. Okay, that was lateral tibial plateau fractures. Now another of our occult knee injuries is an extensor mechanism injury. 
What we're essentially talking about here is disruption of either the quadriceps tendon or the patellar tendon. Now quads tendon injuries typically occur in patients over 40 years of age and patellar tendon ruptures in the ones under 40. Historically, extensor mechanism injuries are described as a triad of acute knee pain with difficulty weight bearing, an inability for the patient to straight leg raise, and then any evidence of a suprapatellar or infrapatellar gap similar to what we see on the screen here, where we see an obvious defect just above the patella consistent with the suprapatellar gap. I think the key thing here is just to get every knee injury to straight leg raise. If they can't truly straight leg raise, then something's up and you really need to consider the possibility of this diagnosis on your differential a little bit more seriously. As Dr. Sayal said in the main podcast, the knee immobilizer in the ED is akin to amoxicillin in the walk-in clinic. I mean, these things are just getting doled out way too often in the ED, and we can do a little bit better than that. In reality, the indications for a knee immobilizer and soft tissue injuries are actually for extensor mechanism injuries. So those individuals with a first-time patella dislocation, you know, quadriceps tendon rupture, or a patella tendon rupture. Patients with these injuries should appropriately be placed in a neomobilizer, and they're going to require semi-urgent orthopedic follow-up because typically they're going to need surgery within one week to repair that extensor mechanism. Now, with that being said, neomobilizers are not indicated for suspected meniscus and ligament injuries. Immobilizers haven't been shown to aid in the healing process, they increase the rate of falls in older patients, and they're likely going to lead to muscular atrophy and decrease the range of motion in our patients. So try to minimize that reflex to just reach for a knee immobilizer in every patient with a knee injury. Think of the indications that we got up here on the screen and try to be diligent in your use of them. The last occult injury we're going to cover is the ACL tear. Generally speaking, the diagnosis of ACL tear is usually going to be made on history alone because really, unfortunately, the physical exam in the ED just doesn't add very much info because, you know, patients just can't often tolerate the provocative testing we try to do. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do a good knee exam to try to rule out the possibility of an occult knee dislocation or other injuries, but I think it's important to realize that the most meat we're going to get is really from our history. For the most part, ACL tears are going to occur in the setting of sports, and actually, surprisingly, they're not going to be as a result of two players running into each other. And typically, individuals are going to have such significant injuries that they're actually going to have to be carried off of the court or the field because they're not going to be able to do it on their own. For an ACL tear, we're going to get a history of a sudden deceleration. The knee's going to twist with the tibia pushed anteriorly, and there's going to be a bit of a valgus stress. About 70% of patients are going to report some pop or some sort of buckling or giving out associated with the incident. These individuals are going to swell typically pretty quickly, as opposed to meniscus injuries, which are going to be a little bit more delayed. And lastly, practically speaking, the Lachman test is the only useful physical exam maneuver for the assessment of the ACL. You know, the anterior drawer and the pivot shift test just really cause too much pain in the acute phase for our patients to be able to tolerate them when they're acutely injured in the ED. In terms of x-ray pearls for ACL injuries, in pediatric patients with a suspected ACL tear, look for a tibial spine fracture on both the AP and lateral x-rays. Now, these kids with this fracture pattern are actually going to require immobilization and extension while they await their orthopedic follow-up. In adult patients with suspected ACL tear, look for Sagan fracture at the lateral aspect of the tibia, which is going to confirm your diagnosis of that ACL tear. Now, in terms of management of adult ACL injuries, remember to avoid those knee immobilizers like we talked about a few slides ago. Tell your patients to let pain be their guide, get them to weight bear as tolerated, and get them to engage in some early range of motion exercises. Really, that's going to help them avoid stiffness, and it's going to prevent any delays in their return to normal activity. One last thing to be aware of is the lock knee. In any patient suspected of a meniscus injury or an ACL tear, you really want to assess to make sure there's not any evidence of a locked knee. Now, simply put, a locked knee is really just that the knee can't fully extend. Now, all you do is that you just gently compare passive extension of the injured knee to the contralateral knee. If you're unable to extend the patient's injured knee to the same degree as that contralateral side, you're going to just want to assume that they've got a locked knee. And then, you know, it's probably as a result of something like a buckle handle, meniscus tear, an ACL injury, or maybe they've got a loose body in there that's causing the locked knee. It's important to pick these up in the ED because without early physiotherapy, patients with a locked knee can actually be at an increased risk to have a permanent decreased range of motion. And some of these patients actually are going to require arthroscopy within six weeks to avoid any long-term disability. Now, that's in opposition to the majority of isolated meniscal injuries, which can actually wait up to about three months. So, you know, if you've got a patient in front of you that you have a suspicion of a locked knee and they're unable to do a straight leg raise, well, then you really might want to get them in a little bit earlier to see that orthopedic surgeon. So send in a semi-urgent referral and have these patients assessed as early as you can. Well, that's it for part two of occult knee injuries. In summary, remember to maintain a broad differential and specifically assess for knee dislocation, lateral tibial plateau fracture, extensor mechanism injury, and ACL tears.
Try to be a little bit more diligent in our use of knee immobilizers. Remember the indications for them, and that's really just for those extensor mechanism injuries. And then lastly, if you have an individual with a concern for you know, potential meniscal injury or an ACL tear, then make sure you assess for that locked knee. That's all for me for now. Thanks for your time, and I hope you learned something. For references and a written summary on occult knee injuries, go to the Emergency Medicine Cases Summary for Episode 91 at emergencymedicinecases.com.